It's my good pleasure to welcome you to this service of worship online at Grace United Methodist Church. This is Sunday, May the 23rd, also happens to be Pentecost Sunday. This is the Sunday when the church around the world remembers the gift of the Holy Spirit, God's presence given to the church. Some call this the birthday of the church, the origination of God's church on earth. We're glad that you're here to worship with us on this day. Welcome. Welcome to this service of worship. I have an extra special thing for you today. Our chair of the stewardship committee here at Grace, Tom Guthrie, has a very encouraging word uh, to offer to you to start our worship together today. Com Tom, come share with us. Just wanted to say a quick word of thanks to all of you here today. Um, this past year has been one of the most stressful and strangest years I think we can all agree in, the, in our personal lives as well as the life of this church. Despite all of that, Grace has continued her mission here in Wilmington, supported many ministries by your gifts and because of your gifts. Ministries such as Mother Hubbard's Cupboard, we're all familiar with Mother Hubbard's Cupboard. We supported that organization for years. But just imagine how much more impactful that ministry has been in these past 14 months. Our giving has enabled food to hit the tables and plates of people in this community that really needed to feel God's love. So thank you for that. You know, we've also had to redo church and remake ourselves in many regards. One way we've done this is this venue right here. Here we are, online, Grace United Methodist Church. How many of us 18 months ago would have thought that this was something Grace would do? Admittedly, we went down this path because we needed to find a way to stay connected, we wanted to feel connected. We missed each other. We missed doing the things that we normally do. And this platform has helped us do that. But even more importantly, it's not just helped us inside these walls. We've been able to reach folks we could never have imagined reaching. Folks have tuned into this service that are countless, we'll never know and how we may have touched their lives, or how God may have touched their lives, again, through your giving. And now, normal seems to be approaching, and we're stepping back into this beautiful sanctuary. Your giving has enabled that to happen. And as we continue to find our way, just walking in the door is not gonna do it. You know, we have to be safe about it. But we want to find out ways to turn on the programming that we all know and love and welcome. Sundays, midweek, okay, and that's coming. And it's coming again because of your giving. I wanted to say thank you. Thank you very much for that, particularly in times that could not have been very pleasant, perhaps for your families. So one final thank you and just say it, all praise be to God. Now, if you will, join us in the call to worship. It is responsive. That means you have a part to play in this. The words will be on your screen. Join us in this. Come, Holy Spirit. The wind of God, the breath of life. Come, Holy Spirit. Our advocate, our counselor. Come, Holy Spirit. Teacher of wisdom, reminder of Christ. Come, Holy Spirit. Granter of forgiveness, giver of peace. Come, Holy Spirit. May we feel God breathing through our worship. Let us all receive the Holy Spirit. Like a fire burning within.
As I offer this prayer, will you pray in your hearts? Let's pray. God of wind, word, and fire, we bless your name this day for sending the light and strength of your Holy Spirit. We give you thanks for all the gifts, great and small, that you have poured out upon your children. Accept us with our gifts to be living praise and witness to your love throughout all the earth. Through Jesus Christ who lives with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Luke, chapter 13, 22 through 30. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying through Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter by the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the householder has risen up and shut the door, you will begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, open up to us. He will answer you. I do not know where you come from. Then he will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you talk in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me all you workers of iniquity. There you will weep and gnash your teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And men will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first, who will be last. This is the word of God for us, his people.
Have you ever tried out for a sports team or a play? Have you ever started to learn a new instrument? Have you ever tried to begin a new hobby or learn anything new ever? I think most of us have. Now what if you had never taken that first step? If you never tried out for the team, would you ever become the star player? And if you never started the new hobby, would you ever have collected 117 bouncy balls? I don't think so. When I was 13, I had already taken that step to start a lot of new hobbies. I played instruments, I was singing in the choir and in plays, and I was the goalie on the school soccer team. So I was known as the music and the soccer person, and that's how I knew myself too. But that year, something inside me was really wanting to try something new. I had never done it before, but something just called to me about it. I was thinking about trying out for the cheerleading squad, but I was on the fence, so I talked myself into it, I talked myself out of it. What if I make it, but then people make fun of me? What if I don't make it? Oh, that would be so embarrassing. But what if I do make it and I love it? So I, I didn't know what to do. And then one day I was sitting in music class and I noticed this poster on the wall that I never paid attention to before. And it said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Which of course is a very famous quote by Wayne Gretzky, but in my seventh grade brain, that was the first time I had ever heard that. And I saw it as a sign. So I decided to take my shot and try out for the cheerleading squad. So because of Wayne Gretzky, I ended up being a cheerleader for the next few years and really enjoying throwing people in the air and catching them. That quote on that poster was probably originally about taking shots on goal in hockey, but it can apply to a lot of things in life, including church and having a relationship with Jesus. If we never take the shot to start a relationship with Jesus, then you'll never know what it could be like. However, he did say, knock on the door and it will be open to you, which means he's waiting for us to take that shot. And he wants us to try our best to be Christ-like and faithful and patient. So take that first step along the narrow path to becoming more Christ-like. As Hamilton once said, I am not throwing away my shot. So let's all try to be like Broadway's Hamilton and Wayne Gretzky and take that shot to be closer to Jesus. Today is May 23rd, 2021. This is Pentecost Sunday. This is the day when the church remembers how God gave the Holy Spirit to the church. Some call this the birthday of the church. There was some days, just to recount the story briefly, some days after that first Easter Sunday, about 120 disciples were gathered together in a room and the Holy Spirit fell upon them. They found new boldness to go out and witness to Jesus Christ, to the world boldness that they haven't had not had before. Now, one of the things that's remarkable about that story is that it was a sign of God's invisible kingdom showing up here in the world in a very tangible and powerful way. So in today's passage out of Luke 13, Jesus is teaching about that very same kingdom that showed up at Pentecost. Jesus is teaching, he tells parables about the kingdom of God. Now it sets his disciples to thinking about this kingdom, and so Jesus is asked, will there be many people who were saved, or will it be just a few Then Jesus launches into telling the gathered crowd what it takes to get into God's kingdom. And he says that the door to this kingdom is narrow and few are those who find it. Now I've long been sort of puzzled 
by this statement of Jesus that the door to the kingdom, the way home is narrow. And it puzzled me in this regard. I've always had the impression that Jesus just wants everybody to be saved, that Jesus wants everyone to eventually arrive in God's kingdom. And now here is Jesus saying that the way is narrow, the door is hard to find. What what does he mean by that? Does he mean that there's this long list of religious things that we got to do, that we got to get so good that folks can hardly stand to be around us before we can find that narrow door to God's kingdom? Is that what he means? I think he helps us towards the end of this saying. When we see those that are told in this parable that they will not be allowed admission into God's kingdom, and they're just mystified. And they respond out of their being just befuddled by this. They respond by saying, now wait, wait a minute, Jesus, you, you know us. We were at the same dinner parties that you went to. And we went to your rallies out in our very street. You remember me, right, Jesus? Notice that these people did religious things. They showed up in religious places, even there in the presence of Jesus. Here's the point that Jesus was making, and I think this is why Jesus said the way to the kingdom is narrow and hard to find. It's because it doesn't depend on our goodness. The door to get into God's kingdom depends on grace. Grace means help that we did not deserve nor earn. Now, Jesus' audience for this parable would have been good Jewish folks who would have been taught all their life that the way you get into God's kingdom is by keeping the law. Doing the things the law requires, if you do it good enough, you get into the kingdom. And now here is Jesus saying, no, that's not it. The way is narrow and hard for you because you're depending on that. You're depending on the wrong thing to get you home. The door to God's kingdom doesn't depend on how good I get or how religious I become. It depends on grace, admitting that I need help that I cannot give myself. It depends on grace, that which I did not earn, but was given to me by someone else. Now, we love to talk about grace. We love to sing about it. It is grace that brought me safe thus far. It is grace that will lead me home. Oh, we love that until we have to apply it to ourselves. For me to rely on grace means I have to admit that there's a standard I cannot reach, that there's help I need that I cannot give myself. God has given us that help through Jesus. We only get into his kingdom, and here's why the door is narrow, because Jesus died for us. That's what makes it hard, because I like to think that I can get good enough to earn my way in. It's not that we have to get in by doing some hard task. It's not that we get into the kingdom because we get in the kingdom because we admit we need help. And that is very hard for us to do. We like to be able to measure our fitness for God's kingdom by looking at others. And when we measure ourselves by looking at others, am I doing as well as them? Am I doing worse than them? When we measure ourselves by others, we come up pretty good because we're pretty good. People, but I don't get into heaven because I'm doing better than this number of people over here or that person over there. I don't get into the kingdom because of that. We love to compare ourselves to others. I was on the road and saw this bumper sticker on this slow-moving car right in front of me. I'm reading the bumper sticker on their rear bumper, and it said, I might be slow, but I'm ahead of you. We like to measure ourselves and see if we're ahead of this person or not. And, and if we find enough people that we seem to be ahead of, then we think, well, we must be ter- pretty good. Surely the fact that I'm doing it at least better than these folks gets me into God's kingdom. What makes it hard is we have to admit that there's a standard that we don't measure up to. That's hard for us. We like to think that we kind of, our goodness sort of gets us there, right? When I was on the Outer Banks, there was a family in our church that was about to lose their house, behind on their payments. Church came together in this marvelous way, 
help stave off foreclosure. They gave enough money to help these family keep their house. Great thing. But it's interesting that family never set foot back in the church again. And I think that they were embarrassed. They were appreciative, but I think embarrassed at the same time, particular him. And he thought that, you know, if I go back into church, all these other folks are going to be looking at me. Well, they all measure up. They're all keeping their houses, but they had to, to dig me out of this hole. They had to come along and help me. So I don't measure up. It's hard for us to admit that there's a standard that we don't rise to. And to that end, it's easy for us to measure that our fitness for the kingdom by how religious we are. It's easy to be religious and think that that, that, that gets us in the door. That's what makes the door narrow because that's not what gets us in. But being religious is easy. You know, just check the boxes. Just say your prayers. Do some nice things. Give some money now and again. Sing the hymns when they say hymns. Just check the boxes. And if I look at the boxes that I've checked... This impressive list of religious stuff that I've done right here, surely that gets me in. You know me, right, Jesus? Depending on the narrow way of grace doesn't allow me to depend on my list. It doesn't allow me to depend on anything that I've done for myself. In fact, depending on grace, help I didn't earn, makes me admit exactly that, and that's why it's hard for us. It makes me admit that there's help I need that I can't give myself. There's a standard that I can't rise to. That's tough for us. Those at the end of Jesus' parable, when he says the door is narrow and few are those who find it, these religious folks say, now wait wait a minute, Jesus, we've checked all the boxes. We've done all the right stuff. Jesus, we were hanging around where, where you are. We've done religious stuff. And Jesus says, I don't know where you're from. In other words, he's saying, I don't know you. Just checking the boxes, and this is what makes the way to the kingdom narrow and hard, is it doesn't allow us to depend on what we wish it depended on, which was our own goodness, our own impressive list of good things that we do and Proof of being the good people that we are and saying, here you go, Lord, this this gets me. You know me, right, Jesus? Depending on grace, help I don't, that I need, that I can't give myself, does not allow me to do that. And that's why the door is narrow. Now, imagine for a moment, if we treated our marriages the same way we treat being religious. You know, just check the boxes and that'll be good enough. Imagine if we approached our marriages that way. You know, just bring home the paycheck, help the kids with their homework, help give them baths and put them to bed, come home faithfully at whatever time, every night. And all these are good things. You know, just check the boxes and that makes a good marriage, right? Well, all these things are important. But what if we checked all the boxes And there never came that moment in our marriage where we made our spouse, where we made him, where we made her, where we made them feel like they were the most important person on the planet to us. And that but for them, our life would be less. What if there were a moment where we never made them feel that way? Checking all the boxes, but we're not saying, you know what? I need you. It just wouldn't be the same thing, would it? There'd be something massively missing under our roof. It's the same thing with our relationship with Jesus. Just checking all the boxes, it's just not enough. We like to think just checking the boxes in our relationship with God and our journey to the kingdom, that that's what will get us there. Jesus said, no, when we think of it that way, we're missing the narrow door to his kingdom. Jesus told another parable in Luke chapter 18. A tax collector and a Pharisee went to the temple to pray. Now to Jesus' audience hearing this parable... 
the Pharisee was the good guy. He was really religious. He was a great example to his community. Now, you talk about checking all the boxes. Now, this guy was getting it done. He was doing it. On the other hand, you have praying there in the temple at the same time, this tax collector. He was the villain of the story. They would have hated this guy just simply because he was a tax collector. He was betraying his own people, the Jewish people, working for their captors, for the hated Roman government. He was choosing Rome over his own people, his own, his own nation. They would have hated this guy. He was the bad guy of the story. Now, when they're both praying, the Pharisee spent his time making sure God knew how good he was, showing God his impressive list of religious stuff and good stuff that he was all about to impress God, and surely that got him in the kingdom. The Pharisee prayed this way, You know, Lord, I tithe all the time. I show up in church all the time. I'm a great neighbor. I helped mow, mow Miss Smith's yard last week. You see all the good things I've done, right, Jesus? I know you're glad I'm on your team. That's how the Pharisee prayed. Look at the boxes that I've checked, Lord. Now the tax collector prayed differently. He said, Lord, I know I'm not all I should be. But if you have any mercy at all for someone like me, I'll take it. He, unlike the Pharisee, acknowledges that he needs some help that he could never give himself. He can never be good enough to earn his way into God's kingdom. Now, it's really interesting when you read the story, this tax collector doesn't even promise, okay, I'll do better now, Lord. All that tax collecting thing, I'm going to let that go and do better with that. Never says that he goes there. All he says is, Lord, I need your mercy. Here's the ironic twist of this parable that Jesus tells of the Pharisee and the tax collector at prayer in the temple. The ironic twist is this, that it's not this upstanding Pharisee with the impressive list with all the boxes checked of the religious and good stuff he does that leaves that time of prayer in the temple justified in the sight of God. It's not him. Instead, it's this ne'er-do-well, hated tax collector that leaves that time of prayer justified. That's the twist of the parable. And it's interesting when you read the very beginning, the intro to this parable there in Luke 18, Jesus says that he told, Jesus told the parable, as Luke records it, because there were some who thought they were righteous right before God in and of themselves because of their impressive checklist that they could present to God. And Jesus was saying in this parable, no, it's, that's not what gets you in the narrow door of the kingdom because it's not what you think. The door to the kingdom is not narrow because there's this long, hard list of stuff we've got to do. It's because of what we have to admit about ourselves that's very hard for us to do. And that's that good as we are, we need help that we can't give ourselves. That's where this Pharisee at prayer in the temple missed the boat. Good guy. But missed the door to God's kingdom because he was dependent on the wrong thing. We too have to admit that there's help that we need that we can't give ourselves that gets us into God's kingdom. That's why the door is narrow and that's why it is hard for us. We don't get into the narrow door by virtue of some list of religious stuff we've done with check boxes. We get in because we rely on what God did for us in Jesus, on that grace, help, that we could not give to ourselves. It's hard for us to admit that we need God's help. But I really believe this. When we admit it, when we say, God, I, I can't do this for me. Lord, help me like the tax collector at prayer did. Lord, help me. Help me where I can't help myself here, Lord. 
I believe in that moment that God runs to us. If we try to enter the narrow door by our own goodness, we are in effect saying we don't need what God did for us in Jesus. I got this, Lord. That thing you did for us on the cross, Jesus, that was really nice, and it's not that I don't appreciate it, Jesus, I do, but I got it. We start sounding a lot like the tax collector. The door is narrow because it's hard for us to admit that we need what God did for us. Not just as a nice idea, but our life depends on it, both here and in the life to come. Depends not on what we do for ourselves, but on what God has done for us. Otto von Habsburg, head of the House of Habsburg, died July 2nd, 2011. About two weeks later, they held his funeral in Vienna. It was an oppressive affair that you'd expect for someone of one of these families that was a dynasty. The huge funeral procession made its way through the streets of Vienna. They came to the door of the cathedral where the funeral would be held. The usher leading the procession to the doors of the church knocked on the doors, and the sound of it just thundered through this empty cathedral. From inside the closed doors, the priest responds to the knock saying, Who comes here? The usher answered, giving all of Otto's impressive titles. Otto of Austria, former crown prince of Hungary, prince royal of Hungary and Bohemia, of Dalmatia, Croatia, Slovenia, Grand Duke of Tuscany and Krakow, Duke of Lorraine of Salzburg, Grand Prince of Transylvania, Margrave of Moravia, Duke of Silesia, Medina, Parma, on and on and on. The list went, took a while. When he was through, the priest answered from inside the still closed doors, We don't know him. A second time, there was the knock on the doors, and again, the question was asked, who comes here? Again, the answer was the long list of impressive titles. Otto, former crown prince of Hungary, prince royal of Hungary and Bohemia, of Dalmatia, Croatia, on and on, so forth, so on, once again. Same answer. We don't know him. The third time there was the knock on the door. And again, the question from inside, who comes here? This time the usher answered differently. We bring our brother Otto, mortal sinner, in need of grace. The doors opened. The funeral procession entered the church. We are known by the kingdom of God, not because of our long list of religious and good things we've done with all the boxes checked, but we are known by the kingdom of God because we've relied on that which we could not do for ourselves on grace. And that is hard for us, and that's what makes the door narrow. If we want to find the narrow way, then we have to admit what is hard for us to admit, that there's a standard to which we cannot live. It's not about being better than this person or over here or that group of people over there. It's about relying on the one thing that gets us home, and that's what God has done for us through Jesus on the cross, where he gave us help that we could never give to ourselves. It's what makes it hard because it's hard for us to admit that our list, as impressive as it is, is not what gets us home. Jesus is the narrow way home.
Let's pray. Gracious God, living and eternal Holy Spirit, we thank you that you seek us in tender loving care, lest any be lost. Help us in the same way to reach out towards those who may feel alienated or excluded from you. Send your Holy Spirit upon us that when we speak the word of your love, people may hear and understand it in their own language as on that Pentecost day so long ago. O Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit once again that the world may know the gifts and blessings of your power. Take away our confusion and grant us clarity of vision. Open our senses to the mystery and wonder of faith. Open our minds to the signs of hope you seek to share with us. Lord, our Creator, earth has many languages, but your gospel proclaims your love to all nations in one heavenly speech. Make us messengers of the good news that, through the power of your Spirit, everyone everywhere may unite in one song of praise. For we pray this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Thank you for having joined us for this service of worship today. We hope you will come back again and join us next Sunday. But for now, receive this benediction. Now go into the world as children of God, set free by the rushing winds and blazing fires of the Holy Spirit. Go in the name of God the Father who creates us, in the name of Christ Jesus who redeems us, and in the name of the Holy Spirit who guides us. Amen.